for today, first exam. And remember that uh, in, in here, if you go to prior exams, there's prior exams up there so you can take a look at what you know, past exams have looked like. So that's a good place to, to practice doing some uh, work before next Monday. And also, I went through in D2L, and anyone that didn't get a perfect score on the first quiz, I deleted your lower attempt so that you can have one more attempt, and it's due tomorrow night. So homework and quiz tomorrow night. So if you didn't get a perfect score on the quiz yet, you still have a chance. All right. Any questions on that? OK, and on the exam, you can't have any graphing calculators or phone calculators. So scientific calculator only. All right, let's get the, through this heinous problem. We have one heinous problem, and then we'll jump into 7.3. We'll do hyperbolics. Hyperbolic functions are something that we won't spend a lot of time on. There are functions that are interesting, but in practice, they're not used that frequently. There is one hyperbolic function that's used a lot, and we'll focus more on that one. Um, but in general, you won't see hyperbolic functions very frequently, so we don't spend a ton of time on them. Our last problem in 6-7 is a doozy. Let's just go back to the beginning, because it feels like it was forever ago that we were doing force on a, on a wall. So in this example, we're doing the force on a window. Little circular window at the bottom of a pool, four meters deep. And our acronym for finding force is ADD area. So we want to use ADD area. A is acceleration, D is density, D is depth, or distance from the surface. So ADD, same as it is for the work problems, acceleration, density, depth or acceleration, density, distance, however you want to think of it. And then for work, we had volume. For force, we have area. And we are not talking about the area of the window. We are talking about the area of that little thin blue strip. The height of that little thin blue strip is dy. So the only missing piece for the area is the width across there. So width across multiplied by dy, that's the area that we speak of. Tiny little area. So in order to find that width, we had to find the equation of the circle. We had to write the left side and the right side. So we find the equation of the circle. We solve for x because if we're finding horizontal distances, horizontal distances are x values. So we have to take the right x and subtract off the left x. We have two ways here. We could write the right x as that and the left x as minus the square root. Or we could use symmetry and say, oh, well, this x is measuring halfway across the element, so we could just double that. So those are the two ways that you can conceptualize getting the full width of that blue strip. Right minus left, or double the right. Any questions up to that point? Finding the area, the equation of the circle. So that's a symmetry two, right? That's usually the two is a symmetry two, right? Because when we look at this function right here, x equals a function of y, that's measuring from the y-axis over. So it's only going to give us half the width of the strip. So then we double for symmetry. There's just as much of that blue strip on the right as there is on the left, so we could just double that. That will be the width of our strip. So then we, then we put in, hmm, it was working a moment ago. So then we put it into our formula here, uh, ADD, and then the width of the strip times the thickness of the strip, there's the area of the strip. And we got down to this crazy place uh, right here. 
And the only technique you really know for integration is substitution. When you're substituting, you look inside the square root. And it's like, okay, that's what you should be. But the problem is when we let u be that, it doesn't match what's on the outside. So here's where we're going to get creative. I wouldn't put in a, an exam question like this. This is just a little too complicated, a little too much ingenuity to bother with on an exam. But what we're doing here is saying that we're trying to, we can match the minus y plus half dy. If we could, if we had this over there, we could replace it with du over 2. And so what we often do in math is try to rewrite in a way that changes the look, but not the value. It's kind of like changing units. It changes the look, but not the value. So here, we're going to rewrite the 4 as 3 and a half plus a half. That's fine, right? You can rewrite 4 as a sum of two numbers. And then we're going to do a distribution thing that is, I swear this was working earlier, that I did not have to push on that. So we're going to do this funky distribution thing. So recall that if you have simple, a simple setup like this, a plus c, a plus b plus c, all times d, if you wanted to, there's lots of ways to do distribution. You could write this as a plus b times d plus c times d. You could distribute it to all three pieces right away if you wanted. You could distribute it to the first one, and then you could pair out these two. All of these are equal. Right? When you do a distribution of, of a factor out in front. And what we're going to do here is distribute this root in that creative way. We're going to put the 7 halves right there. So we're going to distribute this to the 7 halves first. And then we're going to distribute it to this yellow piece. And we're essentially going to create two integrals. So I'm going to put a big bracket. I'm going to put a dy there. And then we're going to make our second integral, which will also go 0 to 1. And we'll have the 1 half minus y times the square root dy. OK, so just a little algebra trick so far. Just split the 4 into 3 and a half and a half and distribute. Now, for the one on the right, that's what we use this substitution for. We did this, and it's going to match right there. 1 half minus y is right there, so we can do an immediate substitution. Let's just let the first integral linger for a moment. We're just going to let it linger. We'll get to it in a minute. And we could actually pull out the 7 halves. So let's do that. Let's put our bracket. And we'll pull the 7 halves right out of the front there. And we'll just deal with this one in a minute. And for the second one, let's go ahead and use this substitution that we have here. So this substitution, this substitution u equals negative y squared plus y. That's inside the square root. All right. And the minus y plus half, OK, that's going to be du over 2. So we'll put the over 2 right there. We'll put the du right there. We'll put the square root of u right there. So everyone follow the substitution there? <clears throat> so the, that, including the dy, that all becomes du over 2. Dunk, dunk, square root of u. How about limits of integration? Everybody agree? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if the y limit is 0, we plug that in up here to get the corresponding u. Certainly 0. Plug in the 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. What is the integral from 0 to 0? Gone. That's all equal to 0. So pretty, cle pretty clever. Let's see. That's not going to work. I have to use my finger now. So that integral is gone. Now we come back over here. These twos cancel. That's a 2 in the denominator. That's a 2 in the numerator. So now we have 9,800 times 7. 
times this integral. Let's just pull it out and write it here. And we can use geometry to find the value of this integral. We cannot integrate that yet. We don't have a way to integrate squares that are buried inside of square roots yet. The only way we could integrate a square inside of a square root is if there happened to be a derivative out on the front that we could use u sub to suck it up. So we could do this because there's a derivative out in front, but we can't do that with integration yet because we don't know trig sub. But we know geometry. We know what this means. So this right here is the area between the curve and the x-axis, uh, excuse me, and the y-axis. That's what an integral represents. If you have an integral, like in California, you say it all the time, area beneath the curve. So if you have this type of thing, and there's your A and there's your B, the integral represents the area beneath the curve. Now for us, we have a sideways function. It's like, it's half of a circle. So if this is x equals g of y, then the integral is going to represent this area here, similar to how the integral represents that area there when you're integrating with respect to x. So integrating with respect to y, area beneath the curve really means area between the curve and the y-axis. <clears throat> well, what is that curve? Let's come, let's come back up here where we created that function. That curve is right there. That curve is the right side of this circle over here. Let's use that weird color. That is this curve. Zero to one, that curve. So what does the integral of that curve from zero to one represent? Area of the semicircle. Right? That curve is right there. And if you integrate it, you're going to get this area. So from 0 up to 1, you're going to find the area between that curve and the y axis. Oh, that's the area of the semicircle. And that semicircle has radius 1 half. So this integral here is the area of semicircle with r equal one half. <clears throat> we know how to find the area of a semicircle of radius one half. Super simple. So we're going to have 9800 multiplied by 7 multiplied by pi r squared divided by 2. Area of a circle divided by 2 gives the area of a semicircle. And that is going to give us 1 fourth times 2 is 1 eighth. So we're going to have 9,800 times 7 times pi all divided by 8. Uh, and whatever that gives us, that'll be our force. Question. So it's 8575 pi. Units. So we're talking about force, force on a window, force on a wall, newtons. Work, newton meters or joules, force, newtons. So any, any question on any of those funky steps? So again, this is a little more complicated than a test question, but it's something that when you're sitting there and you have plenty of time, you should be able to work it out. This is something you should be able to sit down and understand each step if you give it the time. Basic concept, which tends to be a little, we don't do it a lot in Calc 1, integrating with respect to y. 
but it means the same thing as integrating with respect to x. The integral gives you the area between the curve and the axis. <coughs> so integrating with respect to y gives you this area, integrating with respect to x gives you that area. <coughs> so we'll go to 7.3 unless someone has a question on this. And then we should be able to pretty <coughs> easily finish 7.3, so then we'll go over other types of things, any questions that you might still have from homework, or uh, if you don't have any questions from homework, I'll throw out some sample uh, test problems, concepts that would be good to know for the test. Okay, so let's go to seven. Chapter seven, hyperbolic functions. <clears throat> so first off, when you look at these Hyperbolic functions, they look a heck of a lot like trig functions, so the immediate question is, well, why do we use, you know, the COS and SIN, why do you sine and cosine modify for this? To get that understanding, let's first go back to the circular functions, the regular trig functions are based on a circle, and let's just notice a property. When you're looking at a sector in a unit circle, there are a few properties. You can think of this T right here as the angle in radians. You can also think of that T as the arc length because we have a formula that says S is equal to R theta. And if R is equal to 1, then the angle and the arc are the same. That's one of the most important properties the unit circle has is that this angle and that arc, they have the same the same numerical whatever, rotation or distance. So T radians or T, if you're talking about centimeters, T centimeters. So the angle and the arc are the same numerically. Most, one of the most important properties of the unit circle. Angle equals arc if you're on a unit circle. Now, area of the sector of a unit circle, of any sector, area of a sector is one half theta r squared. So A equals 1 half theta if R is 1. And if you solve for the angle, you get that theta is equal to 2 times the area of the sector. Not a property we usually look at. But if you wanted to, you could say that that area right there that area right there is t over 2, or t is twice the area. And that is the connection to the hyperbolics. If we look at the unit hyperbola, the right side of the unit hyperbola, there's the unit hyperbola, this is the right side, this is going to be called a hyperbolic sector, and it has the same property. The t value right there, which we can't draw it like we can up here, so here, the angle T is there, or you could imagine it as this arc length, like there's a geometric place for that T. As T is pi over 4 radians, you know, you're visualizing this rotation of 45 degrees. It's not the same with the hyperbolics. In this graph of the hyperbola, T doesn't show up, which kind of gives us a clue that the hyperbolics aren't going to be quite as important. There's not going to be the same geome geometric significance that there is for the circular functions. So that's our hyperbolic sector, and it is that T value that's right there will be twice the area of that sector. So that's sort of how they're connected. Is that important to us? Not really, but this just sort of says, okay, yeah, they are connected. That's why we use the same wording, essentially because there is, a definite, there is definitely a connection. Now another place that the circular functions are very useful is that we know a bunch of points on the circle. Right? We know all of our multiples of 30 and 45 all along the circle. The unit hyperbola, not so much. We don't have special values on a hyperbola that we know. Right? So there's not going to be that same type of thing where you have a unit circle and you know a bunch of values instantly. Hyperbolics, you just don't have special values. So you're always dealing with irrational numbers. Almost always dealing with <coughs> irrationals, and you have to use a calculator. So again, not quite as great as circular functions, but they'll have a place. So first off, these 
are the definitions of sine and cosine. Oh, excuse me. Hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. Definitions of hyperbolic cosine, hyperbolic sine. And you look at that and you're like, whoa, they're defined in terms of exponentials. Then you have to ask the question, does that mean the trig functions can be defined in terms of exponentials? Like it opens up a, a, certainly some questions. And up until this point, you probably have never associated sine or cosine with an exponential, right? Not something that you've seen. And that, that is going to make a lot more sense when we get into chapters 10 and 11. Chapters 10 and 11, when we start talking about power series, you will all of a sudden see that there is a connection between sine, cosine, and the exponential function. It's not obvious, but we will see it. Uh, and that will be also where you can, for the first time perhaps, uh, come across the, I'm sure you've probably seen this identity, Euler's identity, mm -hmm. most profound mathematical equation that there is. The five most important constants in math in one equation with no fluff? Like, there's nothing else in it. It's just the five most important constants in all of mathematics in one crazily simple looking equation. And so once we get to power series, we'll be able to sort of understand why Euler's formula is true. We're not going to do a lot of work with Euler's formula. If you go to some more advanced classes, you'll work with it. But um, you know, it's, but it's in a, a lot of you have seen that equation at least. If you're going to go get a tattoo this weekend, it's <laughs> a good one. That's a good formula. Okay, so let's get back to these hyperbolics. So, first off, terminology. It's weird. They're not, these functions are not used so much that there is an agreed upon way to say each of the functions. So you can go to different states in this country, and you'll hear different professors use different terminology. You go to Europe, and you'll hear even different, uh, furtherly different terminology. This one, hyperbolic sign, most people are going to call that cinch, most of the time. Most of the time, you are going to hear one of two ways to say this, either kosh or kosh, either one. I typically will say kosh and cinch. So you can say cinch and kosh or whatever. You can say kosh. It doesn't matter. But whatever. Sometimes people will say cinch and cosinch. That's another possibility. That seems a little weird until you hear the next ones. Tanch and cotanch, setch and cosetch. That's a pretty common way to say these, tanch, cotanch, setch, cosetch, which makes it seem a little more plausible to say cinch and cosinch. But again, most people are going to say cinch and kosh. Most of the time. Or cinch and kosh. Doesn't matter. <laughs> again, they're just not used that much that we have, we just don't have any sort of agreed upon way to pronounce them. Okay, so first off, kosh. It is an average of growth and decay. e to the x, exponential growth function. e to the minus x, exponential decay function. Add them together and average, you have just average growth and decay. So you can think of the cosh as the average of growth and decay, if you want. e to the x plus e to the minus x divided by 2. Cinch is the difference of growth and decay divided by 2. The other ones, we don't really care so much about. If you had to find them, you could, because we're going to have the standard trig relationships. Tangent is sine over cosine. Tanch is cinch over cosh. Put cinch over cosh, can cancel out the twos, and you'll get to that. So, but we don't usually focus on the exponential form of the <coughs> hyperbolics other than perhaps these two, but then even then, not all the time, just infrequently. Okay, so the next thing we notice is the pattern I was just sort of illustrating. Tangent is sine over cosine, tangent is cinch over cosh. 
Sech, like secant, is the reciprocal instead of cosine, reciprocal of cosh. So the pattern is persistent all the way through here. The basic reciprocal identities, the basic quotient identities, those all parallel exactly the trig functions. So that's not, that part's not hard. Okay. And then, of course, we have a bazillion identities, many of which are not going to be that important to us. We're not going to talk about the odd even properties. You know, you should know from algebra that if you plug in negative x and it just simply, and the negative sign eventually vanishes, that's an even function, symmetric about the y axis. So we have even, odd, odd, but we're not going to focus on that. Uh, these are important. They are the Pythagorean identities for the hyperbolics. So we have one major difference. Right there. Instead of a plus, we have a minus. They come from a hyperbola instead of a circle. So cos squared minus sin squared is one. That's our fundamental identity. And from that fundamental identity, you can build these two auxiliary equations, just like we do with the circular functions. If you divide everything through by cos squared, you get this one. If you divide everything in the fundamental identity by sin squared, you get this one. So. Primary identity is a little different. It's got a minus instead of a plus. But then the two secondary equations you find in the same way. You divide by either, in this case, cos squared or sin squared. With the Pythagorean for the trig, you divide by cosine squared or sine squared. So that top identity is the most important right there. And we have to come up with a way to remember which one goes before the minus. Is it cos squared minus sin squared or sin squared minus cos squared? We'll come up with a way. That's very intuitive. We don't care about the sum and difference identities, but just to, you know, you know they're there, just like the sum and difference identities are there for trig. We're not going to use them, though. Same with the double angles. Their, their doubles look very similar to the trig, slightly different. We're not going to use those. To, I, I, definitely not on an exam, any of that stuff. Maybe in a homework they'll ask you something. These two, important. So... <coughs> We have our Pythagorean and then the power reduction. And the power reduction looked very similar, but a little different. We know that for cosine squared, the power reduction is 1 minus. Mm. For sine squared, it's minus. And for cosine squared, it's positive. Sin is negative. So. The identity looks almost the same for this one. This one, definitely a little bit different. We just switch the numerator around. <coughs> but again, not super critical. We'll need these from time to time if we're integrating. We have to reduce the power. <coughs> All right, so let's take a look at the graphs. There is the cosh. And there is the cinch. So the cosh, we took e to the x and e to the negative x and divided the sum by 2. And so what you see here is that the exponential growth and exponential decay act as asymptotes for that hyperbolic cosine. And the hyperbolic cosine is the most important hyperbolic function by miles and miles because it is the hanging cable. That's why it's super important. When you have a cable that's hanging between two poles like that, so it's hanging under its own weight, it is not a parabola like Galileo thought. Galileo was wrong. It's not a parabola. It is not a cubic or a quark. No polynomial can be used to model the hanging cable. No trig function can be used to model the hanging cable. The function that models the hanging cable is the hyperbolic cosine. So that is why it is so important, because we do that all the time, right? We hang things, and we want to be able to model things. And if you flip it over, it creates the most stable type of arch that it can support. You know, if you have a bunch of arches and you wanted to put weights on top of them to see which one is the strongest, hyperbolic cosine flipped upside down, St. Louis arch, 
that would be the curve that models that the strongest possible arch. Um, so sometimes you're going to hear this curve referred to as a catenary. Uh, catenary, hyperbolic cosine, hanging cable, they're all referring to the same curve, the hyperbolic cosine. So the hyperbolic cosine is never negative. It's a hanging cable. It's above the x-axis. That gives us a clue as to which direction this inequality, or this equation, where, which function has to be first. It's always positive. But the hyperbolic sine looks a lot like x cubed. It goes up asymptotically approaching the hyperbolic cosine, and it goes down into quadrant 3. So it can be negative. If we know that we have cos squared minus sin squared is 1, it can't be the other way around because sin could be negative, and then you wouldn't get a positive 1. If you want a positive 1, you have to have the bigger function up here, the lower function, you know, bigger minus lower is going to give you positive here. So we definitely, um, that can help us. Knowing the graphs can help us remember that it's cosine, cos squared minus sin squared is one. So there's only two values that we really ever expect anyone to know. Sin of zero is zero, cos of zero is one. Those are really the only values that are special. A lot fewer than on a unit circle, where we ask you to know a bazillion points for hyperbolics. Two points. That's it. All right, most important slide for the hyperbolics. Derivatives and integrals. And here's where things are a little different. <clears throat> One very convenient thing is that the derivative of cosh is cinch and the derivative of cinch is cosh. There's no minus to goop up. <laughs> They're all positive. The three primaries, cosh, cinch, and tanch, the three primary functions, just like with the circular function, sine, cosine, and tangent are the primaries, the three primaries all have derivatives that are positive. So the one that's different, the one that doesn't parallel, is that, which means this one's not going to parallel either. So those are the two that we have to remember are different from the circular functions. As we know the derivative of sine is cosine. Oh, I, 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 I highlighted the wrong ones, didn't I? The derivative of cosh, derivative of cosine is minus sine, so it's that one and we're such over here. Let's, oh, I guess it is that one. So it's that one and that one. <coughs> it's those two. Um, Why did they put it in that order? That's weird. So there's a couple, let me just say one thing about order. When you're doing your trig function tables, when you're doing your trig function tables, it's really helpful if you're consistent, you write them the same every time. And the way that I would always write them is this way. Because what is tangent equal to? Sine over cosine, so you've got it right there, this over that, you know. And so they did it backwards. In my opinion, they um, did it backwards here. Like I would have done cinch here and then cosh. Just because it's a lot easier to do your trig tables in this order because then you get the tangent and it's this over this. It looks like a fraction already. So it's a little easier to stay consistent. So anyway, so I would say this is a little backwards. I would put cinch up top. Okay, so the derivative of cosine is minus sine, so here's our backwards one. Derivative of cosh is just cinch. This one parallels the trig, that one parallels the trig, and these two both parallel the trig also. So the thing that's different that somehow you have to remember is that the three primaries are all positive, the three secondaries are all negative when you do the derivatives. The functions parallel, but the signs don't for those two. Cosh and such. All right, integration, similar for these two. And you may not know these integrals super intuitively for your trig functions. We're going to talk about those in a moment. 
And you may not know your integrals of section, or excuse me, secant and cosecant very well. We're not even going to focus on those at all for the hyperbolics. The only integrals that we care about are sinh and cosh, tanch and cotanch. Those are the only two. The, the only two besides sinh and cosh. The only two in that box that we care about. These ones we're not going to do. Okay, so let's focus on integration for a second here. Does anyone know what the integral of tangent is? Let's just do tangent first, regular tangent. Secant squared dimness. Secant squared dimness. Negative. <laughs> anyone have an idea what the integral of tangent is? So the typical way you're going to get to it is to rewrite tangent as sine over cosine, and then use u sub. So this is where I'm going to start talking about something called log form. And this is going to be super important. You are going to see a lot of integrals in the coming weeks that are going to be in log form. You're like, what the heck's that? I didn't hear anything about log form in Calc 1. You know that the integral of 1 divided by x is ln x, absolute x, ln absolute x. And what I want to point out is this relationship. What's the derivative of x? One. One, and that's what's in the numerator. There is a hidden relationship here that is never, is not talked about much. So what about this? If we have something like um, this, so let's just suppose we have a function in the denominator. If we generalize and put the function's derivative in the numerator, lo and behold, you don't even need to use substitution. This is going to be the natural log of the absolute value of the denominator, just like it was here. That's the pattern. The derivative of the denominator is in the numerator. So let's prove it. Well, u sub, pretty easy right here. So if we let u equal f of x, then du is f prime of x dx. And so when we convert to u, we just get integral of 1 over u. That's natural log. And so this integral here just becomes <coughs> integral of 1 over u du. Plugging in the u for the f, and then f prime of x dx all becomes du. And so that's natural log of absolute u plus c. And if you do your back substitution, that's absolute f of x inside the log. So that's log form. That's going to be one of those things we want to recognize, we want to look for. If you have an integral that satisfies this property right here, you're done. You can write down the answer. That brings us back to this. What is the derivative of cosine? Negative sign. We don't have a negative sign. Let's create a negative sign. And then we have to offset it by doing that. So once again, we do this all the time. We just change the look, but not the value. We haven't changed the value, we've just changed the way it looks. Now it's in log form. So we know the answer. This is natural log absolute cosine. Plus C. <coughs> so these Tangent, cotangent, well, let's do cotangent. Cotangent's even easier. Cotangent, we have that. It's already in log form. Derivative of sine is cosine. We don't have to fiddle with any minuses. It's in log form. We can write down the answer immediately. This is natural log absolute sine. So now let's do tanch and cotanch. <coughs> so tanch, just like tan, tan is sine over cosine, tanch is sinh over cosh. Does 
that in log form or do we have to manipulate it a little bit? So if we look back at our, at our derivatives, Cinch and Kosh are each other's derivatives. There's no minus involved. So it's already in log form. So this is good to go. We know the answer. This is natural log absolute Kosh. Do we need the absolute value here for Kosh? It's a hanging cable. It's always positive. So we don't even need the absolute value there for this particular function. It's always positive. How about cotanch? So cotanch is cosh over cinch. Any manipulation needed? Nope. They are each other's derivatives, so it's already in log form. We don't have to worry about the pesky minus. This will be natural log absolute cinch. So that pattern is a pattern that you're going to see a lot, the log form pattern. And when you integrate secant and cosecant, which we will do a lot later on in the semester, just like these functions up here, integrate, uh, the way they didn't write, the, they wrote these, this one a little differently, but you can write both of these as logs. Secant and cosecant also integrate to logs. So if you look at our six trig functions, sine and cosine integrate to each other essentially, but the other four are all going to be logs. <coughs> and so then you ask yourself, well, if the integral of secant is a log, I should be able to put the integral in log form. And you're like, wait, there's only one function. Secant, how do I put that in log form? There's, the denominator is 1. Well, what do we think we do? We're going to multiply by something that has a denominator. We're going to manipulate it so that we multiply by 1 and change the denominator so that it's in log form. We'll do that later. But if something integrates to a log, that means you must be able to put it in log form. All right, I will do the first one here, and you all will do the second one. We are going to... I have a question. Yeah, you. sure. Last slide. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. That's right. You, you, you write it as the regular sine and cosine over here. Oh, never mind. I think These ones are regulars. Regular for, the, for the down ones. These ones are hyperbolics. All right. I'm writing down the wrong one. If you're going to copy stuff, copy it exactly. Correctly, yeah. <laughs> Don't leave off H's. All right, so we're going to start with two basic facts. Derivative of cosh is cinch. Derivative of cinch is cosh. And we'll do this first one. We're going to try to prove the derivative of sech is minus sech tanch. Well, we're going to rewrite sech as a quotient and use the quotient rule. So that's 1 over cosh. We now have it written as a quotient with one of our basic functions. What rule do we use when we're differentiating the quotient? <coughs> Product rule? Quotient rule. So low d high minus high d low. And d low is cinch. They are each other's derivatives. Makes it simple. Divided by low squared, cosh. cosh squared, perfect. And zero times cosh, that definitely is gone. So we have minus cinch in the numerator, and we have a cosh squared in the denominator. We're going to share, we're going to split that cosh apart. So we can put the minus out in front, we're going to create two fractions. And we're going to put cosh in the denominator of each. <clears throat> and in the numerator, we only have one function. We have cinch. If we want to get the order the same as the order is here, it's sech and then tanch, we could write it this way. One there, and then cinch there. One times cinch is cinch. Cosh times cosh is cosh squared. And now we've written it so that those two fractions are going to convert over to these functions there. 
that is going to be minus, that's a set, and that's H. So that'll be how we do it. Now you all try number 21. Prove that the derivative of cosetch is minus cosetch cotange. <clears throat> no problem. Little quotient rule reminder. So low d high again is zero here. Minus high d low is minus cosh. And then over low squared is cinch squared. And then again, we can just split this into two fractions. We'll write cosh as 1 times cosh, make that a cinch, make that a cinch, and then we end up with minus cosh cotange. So we're using our two basic facts. Just thinking about the hyperbolic cosine again. I, just remember that Vsauce has a very cool video. If you take a catenary and you turn it upside down, oh no, 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 you leave it like a hanging cable. You leave it like a hanging cable. It's got a cool property that if you, if you, um, if you drop, if you put a ball on each side, if you drop a ball there, and you put the other ball wherever you want, right there, they're going to hit at exactly the same moment right there. So the time that it takes, regardless of where you put your put a ball here, wherever you put it, it's going to take the same amount of time to get to the bottom there. So it's got this perfect geometry that regardless of where you release the ball, it takes the same amount of time to get to the bottom. And so if you do it on different sides, it'll collide right at the bottom of the middle, same moment. It's the only curve that has that property. Uh, and yeah, those, oh no, no, it wasn't Vsauce, it was the, who, who are the two guys, the um, guys that build all the stuff and then test whether, Mythbusters? Myth, Mythbusters. Mythbusters guys, yeah, I think it was them, that they actually built one of these things and then did the whole, you know, measurement with their, <clears throat> Hyper precise stopwatches. Yeah, they they built a. I think it was a myth. Maybe it was the Mythbusters. Does one of the Mythbusters guys work with Vsauce? Yeah. Do they? So, maybe it was the so, one yeah, Mythbusters yeah, guy and Vsauce. Maybe it was the two of them. It's yeah, not the one that has a mustache. Say again. I think Adam Savage does a lot of stuff online. Yeah, yeah. I think it was Adam Savage or... and uh, and Vsauce. I think they. I think they're the two that built this huge cool thing. What a fun job, right? OK. Let's do some derivatives. So I'll do the first one. We'll do the first one together, and then you do the second one. So we are going to do derivatives, same as we did with trig functions, chain rule, power rule, all that stuff applies. 
it might be really helpful to write this as cotange of 3x quantity to the half. A lot of times it's easier to see the power rule when you have it written out like that. So f prime, we will pull down the half, leave the base alone, and subtract 1. And then we're going to take the derivative of the base. So derivative of the base, it's not one of the primary three hyperbolic, so we know its derivative is definitely negative. Since cross and tanch all differentiate to a positive, the other three differentiate to a negative. We know that the derivative of cotangent is minus cosecant squared. So it's going to parallel that, parallel that perfectly. So we're going to get minus, instead of cosecant, we're going to get cosec squared of 3x. And then we go inside the hyperbolic angle and take the derivative of it. Multiply by 3. So there's the chain rule. So the power rule comes first. Bring down the power, subtract 1, and then we differentiate the base. So that gives us our total derivative. I shouldn't say total. That gives us the derivative. Total derivative has a different meaning when you get into Calc 3. Total derivative is a vector derivative. All right, so then we can simplify this a, a smidge. We could write this as what negative 3 cosec squared of 3x divided by square root of cotanch, 3x. That will be our simplified derivative, or at least one way to simplify it. Yeah, what do you take the number 2? 1 over 1 half? Oh, and the 2. I dropped the 2 somehow. 2 right there. Thank you. OK, you all try this one. Number 27, natural log of sech of 2x. What is the first step for differentiating a log function? Change sec or set set such into one over cosh. You 2x. could do that, but um, we won't need we won't need to if we already know the derivative of such. We just showed that the derivative of such is minus such tanch. We won't have to, you could do that and use quotient rule when, you do, when you're going to the derivative of the inside. But what the very first step, if you're differentiating any log function, is 1 over the inside. So that's going to be our the first thing for sure that we know that we're going to do is going to be 1 over the inside. Now that could turn into cosh right now, right? Because the reciprocal of cosh is such, the reciprocal of such is cosh. So 1 over the inside multiplied by derivative of inside. Yep. So derivative of inside is minus such. Such x minus 2x. Tangent. 
2x times. I think it's 4 times the 2x, isn't it? Pardon? What was the question? No, the derivative of the set 2x is. I think you're right. Is it minus such tanch? Do we agree? I think so. Oh, good. <laughs> so convincing. <laughs> we go back up to derivatives. Yeah. Up there, derivative of such is minus such tanch. Just yeah. like the derivative of secant is sec tan, oh. but with the hyperbolics, we have to put in a minus. For the three others, they're all minus. Okay, so then we actually get some simplification here. That and that will cancel. So we'll end up with negative 2 tan, uh, tanch of 2x. <clears throat> Any questions? It's a simple but looks a little funny. It's simple but funny, yes. Simple but funny. Speaking of simple but funny, one other property that that catenary has is that it is the fastest of all possible ramps. So if you designed a ramp as a catenary versus any other possible ramp, so if you want to get from this height down on a ramp, any other ramp that's steeper up top and then flattens out or is that or is straight, that catenary is going to be the fastest dropping a ball on. It's going to be the quickest one. Of all the possible, of all possible ramps. <clears throat> Product rule. I will do the first one. You will do the second one. So product rule. Recall that f times g prime is first times derivative second plus. And you can do this in a couple ways. Some people say first derivative second plus second derivative first. I will always write it as first derivative second plus derivative first times second because in calculus three, you have to do it that way. g times f prime is true when you're talking about real valued functions, but the commutative law for multiplication does not hold when you're dealing with vectors. When you're dealing with vectors, the commutative law of multiplication does not hold when you're dealing with, a, with vector functions, so you have to do your derivative this way. Um, so if you're doing a if you're doing a derivative of vector valued functions, you have to do it that way. So I just get in the habit now of doing that. So when you get to vectors, you're just doing it correct anyway. <clears throat> okay, so first function is the x. So we'll go first. Derivative of second. Let's think about tangent. Derivative of tangent is secant squared. Secant squared. Derivative of tanj will be such squared. And it will be positive. The derivative of sinh, cosh, and tanch are all positive. The primary three differentiate to positive numbers or positive expressions. Okay, so first derivative second plus the derivative of first is one times the second function. Times the second function. So no real simpl no simplification here really. That would be our derivative. All right, you all try this one. Earn the break. Earn it. I will rewrite this in a way, hopefully, that will help you with your chain rule.
Let me know if you're snagged on anything. Everyone see the predominant operation is multiplication, so the first thing you have to be thinking about is product rule. Predominant operation is multiplication. My, my hand, my other than your handwriting. That looks good. So when we do our product rule, the first function is obviously just x squared. Derivative second. This is where the mistakes happen. We first, and when you put the two on the outside, it's a little more obvious that the 2 comes down, you leave the base alone, subtract 1 from 2, and get 1. So that's the first part of the, of the power rule. That's the power rule part. But then we have to multiply by the derivative of the base. Derivative of cosh is cinch. And then the derivative of the angle. So there's first derivative second. Plus derivative first times the second. That part is not a big deal. And so not a whole lot of combining that you can do. You can combine the, the 2 and the 3 and get a 6, and that's about it. So. You can take a common factor, but not really. And we generally, there's no consensus to pull out common factors, unless you're trying to find zeros. If you're not finding zeros, then you usually will leave it expanded. Finding zeros, it's helpful to have it in factored form, but if you're not finding zeros, there's... Generally, we leave it expanded. Okay, let's take a 10-minute break. Time for a break. That's like right there Okay, so we're going to switch over from derivatives to integrals. And again, you only know one integration technique really so far. U sub. And when we look at this, we see a product of functions. Hopefully. U substitution often works really well when you have a product of functions. If you let U equal one of them, then hopefully the derivative of U is the other one kind of thing. And let's see if we can do that here. So let's let U be tanch. And then what would DU be? Set squared? <laughs> And derivative of tan should be positive. The three primary, cinch, cosh, tan, all differentiate to positive. And then just like derivative of tangent is secant squared, derivative of tan is set squared. And we see that, oh yeah, that works perfectly. Right? This is just going to convert over to <coughs> u times du. U is the tanch, and then such squared dx, that's going to turn into the du. So we get u squared over 2. And that will give us 1 half when we back substitute, replace the u with tanch, we're going to get 1 half tanch squared. Now, sometimes you can do more than one substitution, will work. 
And this is going to be one of those examples. Notice this, that we could think of this integral a little differently. We could say, hey, what about if we break apart the setch and kind of group one of the setches with the tanch? If we break apart that setch squared into two setches, and we let u be setch, then du is going to be minus such tanch times dx. And we could do this. We could also write this as, let's see, if u is such, I'm going to replace this right there. I'm going to turn that into a u. And then down below, we have minus such tanch dx. That's going to be minus du. So I'll put a minus out in front, a du right there. <clears throat> We're going to get minus u squared over 2, so minus 1 half u squared plus c. And now when we back substitute, u is such, so we get minus 1 half such squared of x plus c. So either of those is 100% correct. How would you get from one to the other? With and identity, right? So we have a sine, cosine identity. We have a tangent secant identity. We have a cinch cosh identity. We'll have a such tangent identity. So we'll be able to use a Pythagorean identity if we wanted to show that these really are equal, we would use a Pythagorean identity, if we cared. All right, you all try that. Dustin, Here. Zanon, Declan, Here. Logan, Here. Jeremiah, Here. Jonathan, Here. Brady, Here. Joshua, Here. Damian, Paul, Austin, <clears throat> Anthony, Here. Frank, here. Renee, Brandon, Aiden, Skyler, Roberto, here. Laura, here. Peter, here. Okay, this one should have taken you about five seconds because this is in a very particular form. And that form is called log form. So you should be able to write the answer down immediately because it's in log form. The derivative of that denominator is the numerator. Uh, if you did use u sub, you're, you should let u be the denominator and you'll get to the same place. But you could get there really quickly if you notice log form. So log form is super important. All right. Let's do some more substitution. Let's see. Yeah, let's go ahead and do this one together. All right, so we have two functions again that are being multiplied together. So frequently, we want to let u be 1 and hope that the derivative is the other. This one's just a little bit different. We generally don't want to let u be a product of a trig function, like cotant squared, because then the derivative, you have to bring the 2 down. You have to differentiate the base, and the derivative usually gets a little messy. 
But what we could do is let u just be the base. So we could let it just be cotange of x. So then when we plug in a u, we'd end up with a u squared. We let u be just cotange. So let's see if that works. So if we let u be cotange, then du is going to be minus cos x squared. And that allows us to rewrite the integrand as u squared du, and then a minus sign will pop out in front. What do you think? You see that substitution. So this part, coset squared dx, is right there. So we'll move the minus to the left. So we'll replace coset squared dx with minus du. And then if we let u be cotange, then that's going to be right down here under the 2. So that will become a u squared. That will then be minus 1 third u cubed plus c. And then we'll back substitute. So we get minus a third cotange cubed of x plus c. OK, any questions on that one? You see the problem if you were to let u be cotanch squared? Right, you get 2 cotanch x multiplied by minus cosetch squared would be a mess. Okay, so then you all try this one. Use an identity. I'll write the identity over here. So we know that cinch squared of x is going to be 1. So with sine squared, it's 1 minus cosine 2x, here we just reverse it, so it's going to be one. cosh 2x minus 1. That'll be our identity. So this should parallel what we've done with the integral of sine squared. So the integration is using reverse chain rule. Inside the cosh, we have a linear function. So anytime we have a linear function, we could use u sub, or you can jump right to reverse chain rule. So this is going to be cinch 2x divided by 2 minus x and then a plus c. Integral of cosh is cinch, divide by the derivative of the hyperbolic angle, and we'll probably just multiply this out. When you're factoring out of only two terms out of three, that doesn't help us at all. If you are going to put an answer in factored form, you want it factored <coughs> completely, not just a couple of the terms factored. So. Write it in, a, in an expanded form. Um, any questions on that? So, derivatives and integrals of hyperbolics. That's kind of the primary thing we're focusing on. We're going to do one application and talk about. Uh, 
the inverse hyperbolics very loosely. You do not need to know the inverse hyperbolics other than being able to type them into a calculator. So, and I would not put an inverse hyperbolic on a test. Here, we want to find the volume of this kiln. All we're going to do is find the area of the face, multiply it by the length. That'll give us the volume, the volume of the kiln. So when we're looking at the face there of this kiln, <coughs> the curve that they're using is a trans transformation of the hyperbolic cosine. So it's looking sort of like that. And if we're going to find the area of this face here, we're going to have to integrate uh, either from this left endpoint to the right endpoint or possibly from there to there and double it because we have symmetry. The x-intercept right there, we have to solve the curve equal to 0. So when we set our curve equal to 0, we are going to get cosh of x is equal to 3. And if we want to solve that for x, we have to take the inverse, co inverse hyperbolic cosine of both sides. So this point right here is inverse cosh of 3. Again, the inverse hyperbolics, we don't have special angles. So we're not going to know what that number is. It's just some irrational number. We can type it into our calculator and find out. All the graphing calculators have inverse hyperbolics and hyperbolics. Most of the time, the calculator is going to have them hidden in a menu, the catalog or something. So on the old TIs, they have a catalog at the bottom. You can just go down to C, and you'll see all the you know, inverse hyperbolic, cosine, hyperbolic, cosine, all the C stuff, any, any of those functions. Uh, so let's set up our integral. So our integral will give us the area of the face. We're going to integrate from 0 to hyperbolic inverse cosh of 3, and we're going to double it. And then we're going to integrate our function, which is 3 minus cosh of x <coughs> dx. So that will be the area. So this part we can do by hand pretty easily. This will be 3x minus cinch of x. Three. It's a terrible three. Terrible three. Okay, so that's our antiderivative. Those are our limits. All we can do is plug them in, and this would give us, this will be the exact value of the area. So we would write this as 6. We'll distribute the 2. Inverse cosh of 3 minus 2 times cinch of inverse cosh of 3. That is the exact answer. We want to get an approximation, we just type it into our calculator, or we can use Desmos, <coughs> type it into Desmos. All those things are in Desmos too. And so we do 6 cosh inverse of 3 minus 2 cinch of cosh inverse of three. All right, so there is that. And then we have to multiply by the, but for how long, how wide was that kiln? Six. Six. So then we'll have to put another six out in front if we want to get the volume. So that'll be the volume. So that part will 
will be the volume. Does that make sense? And that's the area, and then this is the volume. Okay? So hopefully you can find your inverse cost stuff and your cost stuff on your calculators. Those, I don't think, have it. I think it does. Oh, yeah, it does. It does under catalog. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're Yeah, okay. That's right. It's the one lower than that. That one has it. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All right, so that's it for 7.3. So let's go over other questions that you have. So anything from six, chapter 6, probably. Many of you don't have questions from chapter 7 yet. So um, what was that question? You said quiz number, <coughs> problem <coughs> number one on quiz six. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Is that the one you are? That's what we discussed. Well, let's go take a look, see if we can. So does that look like the, that's the right one? Yeah. Yeah, that's the right one. Okay, so it says let B, R be the region bounded by the following curves. Find the volume when we're rotating around the x axis. So let's just get a sense of a, a sketch. So x equals zero and y equals zero, the axes, and then cosine. We know that cosine starts high, right? When we plug in zero, cosine of zero is one. So it's going to start up, and then it's going to go down, you know, like that, and then keep on going. So everyone okay with that part? Yeah. So we know that cosine of 21x sits above the, the x-axis and to the right of the y-axis. Now, if we want to figure out where it intersects right there, we'll have to set it equal to zero and solve for x. Maybe we don't even need to do that. Are we using uh, disks here? Yeah. Disks? OK, so then we would need to know that. So if we're going to put this here at x, we're going to have to know that point. So if we set cosine 21x equal to 0, what, the, what does the angle have to be? The 21x has to be equal to what to get to 0? Pi over 42. Pi over 42 would do it. Yeah, pi over 42 would do it. So the angle is pi over 2 is where cosine is 0. When you're going around the unit circle, angle's increasing. The first time you get to a cosine of 0 is at pi over 2. So we would set this angle equal to pi over 2 to solve for x. So we're going to get x equals pi over 42. Yes. So that's the number, irrational number, that's sitting right here on the x-axis. So that's going to be a limit of integration. Is there any question on solving, like how to solve that? So we typically want to go to the unit circle and start rotating until you get <coughs> the first angle that has the desired value over here. And the first angle is we're rotating around. Because you could also say, oh, yeah, 3 pi over 2 also, cosine of 0. But we're going for the first 0, which is going to correspond to the first place that cosine, that the angle has a value of pi over 2. So that'll be our intersection point. So when we go to form a disk, this is rotating around, creating a disk. And the volume will be the integral of the area of that disk. Area of a disk is pi r squared. And what's the radius? Cosine function. It's the cosine function. And we're going to square it. So it's cosine squared of 21x. 
So pi r squared is the area of that disk. We're going to add up all those disks from 1 to pi over 42. <coughs> Any issues or questions with that? So area of a disk is pi times the radius squared, and that function is representing the radius of the disk. So wherever you draw your element, it's this function that's going to give you the height here. It's going to give you the distance above the x-axis, which is the radius. Okay, so here's where we do have to use a power reduction identity. So we're going to reduce the power. So that's going to be 1 plus or minus plus, plus cosine of twice the angle. Divide by 2, let's put it out there. So that'll be our integrand. And that's easy to integrate. We will have pi over 2 multiplied by x plus integral of cosine, sine. sine. Derivative of sine is cosine, so integral of cosine is sine. And now we have to use the reverse chain rule, so we've got to divide that by 42, and this will go from 0 up to that pi value. Plugging in 0 gives nothing, so all we have to worry about is that pi over 42 business. So that will be pi over 2 multiplied by pi over 42 plus sine of pi, which is 0. Everyone agree? Pi is on the uh, left edge of the unit circle, so that's sine of 0. And so we get pi squared divided by 84. Make sense? Make sense now? Can you go up real quick? I just want to see something. Sure. So reduce the power, double the angle. I think they gave me a relationship on the top in the question too, I think. Gave you what? The relationship over there, x squared. Oh, right there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm using that. Other ones from homework or quiz or somewhere? Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't after you do the integral, wouldn't it be uh, x plus or, oh, no, 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 no. You see it? So yeah. that one integrates to the x because the derivative of x is 1. This integrates to sine and then divide by the angle of derivative. Yeah, I forgot. The, <clears throat> the angle derivative. I'm only confusing how to solve this to limit, like, you know, the upper limit, like how to solve the limit things, but I think I got it. Yeah, so be, because we're using disks, we're going to, all these vertical elements are going to come to an end right there. Right. So we have to set that equal to zero. And when you're solving a trig equation, like, for example, <laughs> If you had, oh my gosh, why is it doing that today? So annoying. So if you had something like sine of 4x equals 0, how are you going to solve that for x? Find out the first 0 and the second. So it depends on, depends on the scenario, but the thing that you always do is go to the unit circle and you look for the values where the trig function attains that number. So this trig function, sine of any angle, will be zero if that angle is equal to pi k. So zero pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, five pi, or minus pi, minus two pi, minus three pi, minus four pi. So this would be the general solution. That's the general solution. And then you have to look at the graph or look at the constraints and figure out, oh, well, when k is 0, we're at, we're at the origin. We're at x equals 0. Maybe we're looking for the next 0, so we plug in k equals 1. So you have to somehow 
use the information from your region to figure out where to go from there. But the basic idea is that you look at a unit circle and you figure out where your angle is equal to whatever the values are that show up on the unit circle. So if you have something like tangent of 3x is equal to 1, we again go to the unit circle. Where is tangent equal to 1? Tangent is equal to 1 there or there. So then we are going to set the angle equal to, so 3x will be pi over 4 plus pi k. That would be the general solution. Pi over 4 is the first one, but then you add pi, add pi, add pi, add pi, and those will all bring you to terminal rays that have a tan of, zero, a tan of 1. Solve this for x, and you'll get pi divided by 12 plus pi thirds k. And then you figure out, okay, maybe it's the first two, so k is 0 and k is 1, or whatever, based on the region. So unit circle. The unit circle is key whenever you're trying to solve a trig equation, a basic trig equation. A basic trig equation is a trig function of an angle that's equal to a constant. That's a basic trig equation. All right, other ones from homework or some, somewhere else? Yeah, the last one on the quiz. Last one on the quiz. Oh, yeah, the extended limit. What was that one? I think it's the extended limit to take the bump, the water out of the tank or something. Oh, 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 so an extended, extended limit. limit. Where they just twist it in a little bit. And is that extended thing listed in this question right there, or is it only once you get to it? Does it say it in here? Yeah, I think so. Four meters. Oh yeah, okay, I see it. Yes. I see it. All right, so. <coughs> This is acting so strange. So I can only do that with my finger, not with the pen. Okay, so um, we've got the tank. The water is half full. So we're only up to here. So that'll be six. And let's put in a representative slice. So a representative slice, oops, this is not oriented. Representative slice is right in there. We'll say that that cross section is at y. And then we multiply by dy to get the slice. <clears throat> uh, by pumping the water to a level four meters above the top of the tank. So we've got some pipe coming out, and we're going to drain it right there. So that distance is four. <coughs> Um, okay, so we're going to do our regular stuff, ADD volume. Any issues with this part? Okay, so how far is that cross section of water going to travel to get out that pipe that's four meters above the tank? 16 minus, 16 minus y is the distance that that cross section is going to travel, the, this distance right here. So from our cross section up, that's going to be 16 minus y. So that's the one factor that's going to be a little different. Now our limits of integration, what about those? Zero to six. Zero to six. The limits of integration match the physical scenario. We have water from zero up to six. So the limits of integration are going to count up all the work done in moving each slice out the top, all the way out that pipe there. So then we've got our ADD, and now we need volume, and this is the volume of slice. So the volume of the slice 
is the area of the cross section multiplied by dy. And the area of the cross section here is pretty easy because it's a cylinder, so pi r squared. So pi times r squared times dy. This part right here, this is the volume of the slice. So all the slices have the same radius. So it's not a cone where you have a function for the radius. All the radii are the same. It's three for every single slice. <coughs> so then all the constants come out to the front, and we just integrate that, 16 minus y. So the key here is that the limits of integration have to match the physical location of the water. And the distance each cross-section travels now has this little extra piece that we have to take into consideration. Make sense? Any other ones you want to look at? So let's do... One of the, let's see, let's do, let's definitely do a, a, a shell method around a non-axis just to practice that, because that just seems to drive people crazy. So let's suppose we have, y equals cosine of 2x. And that, let's just go through the setup, because I think we're going to get to an integral that's not going to be integrable yet. So then let's rotate. First, I guess, before I tell you what the axis is, can you tell me what this intersection point is? Pi over 4. Pi over 4. Why? Because... This is going to be the first place that this function hits zero, which is going to correspond to the first place that cosine has a zero value. First place that cosine has a zero value is pi over 2. So we set pi over 2 equal to 2x. So that will be pi over 4. Another way to think of it is if you plug in pi over 4 there, you get cosine of pi over 2, which is zero. Yeah. OK, so that's whatever it is. So let's make this 1. So that's going to be our axis of rotation. So let's go and figure out uh, the volume. I don't seem to want to let the pen equal that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Why is it so finicky today? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we're going to rotate about that axis right there. Find the volume using shells. Or at least set it up. I don't think we're going to be able to integrate. Until you know ultraviolet voodoo. Uh, area of a shell, 2 pi r h. What direction should your integration element be? Vertical or horizontal? Horizontal. Vertical. 
Yeah. Oh, you. That's part of the intro. Whatever. <laughs> it is there in your final answer, though. That'd be hard to take a point off of that. Vertical element, everybody agree? Because to create a cylinder, axis and element have to be parallel to create a cylinder, otherwise you create a washer. <clears throat> Distance to the axis of rotation is right there. That is corresponding to the radius of the shell created. And what is that distance? X is this distance. One sans X. One sans X. So one minus X is going to be the radius. And how about the height? I think the function is the height. Function is the height. Cosine two X is measuring your vertical distance. So that is going to be H. So cosine 2x. And your volume is then 2 pi integral from 0 to pi over 4. And we're going to have, I'm going to, I'll distribute this cosine of 2x. So there's our setup. Now, at this stage, we can't integrate this product. So we have been able to integrate some products with u sub, but remember the kind of key to being able to integrate a product with u sub is that if you let u be one of them, the other thing has to be a, the derivative. Like there's got to be a connection between the function that you let u be and the <coughs> derivative. And that's not here. So this we're going to integrate later in a couple weeks. This is going to be integration by parts, which is also known as ultraviolet voodoo. Integration by parts. So we'll get to that. We'll get to that later. Now, set it up with washers. So same problem, except let's do the setup with washers. And the area of a washer Pi times outer radius squared minus inner radius squared. Big disk minus small disk. What do you think the outer radius is? One. Good. So the outer radius is going to be from the left curve all the way over to the axis. That's the outer radius. Because right? the left curve is just this axis right there. The right curve is the cosine. So that's the outer radius. 
We're going all the way over to the furthest edge of our region. Okay, so that's 1, and 1 squared is 1. All right, here we go, hard part. Inner radius is from the axis of rotation to the right edge of our region. So it's that distance. And what is that? No. 1 minus, one minus x. Inverse cosine x over 2. Yeah. So inverse cosine, because we have to isolate x. We're finding a horizontal distance. So anytime we have a horizontal distance, it's right x minus left x. We know the right x, that's x equals 1. The left x is from this function, the blue function, but it's not written as an x value. It's written as a y value. It's written as a height. Not a horizontal, it's written as a vertical, not a horizontal. So we have to take that and inverse cosine of both sides. So inverse cosine of both sides will give us that. And then solve for x, we're going to divide by 2. And that is going to be this curve right there, written as an x value. So now we can do right x minus left x. So the right x is 1, and the left x is that thing. That's all squared. So that'll be the setup for the area and volume. We'll just integrate from where to where? 0 to 1. This thing. And let's not even foil that out. That'll be pretty messy. So that's our setup for a washer. And again, we don't know how to integrate inverse trig functions yet. Integration by parts. Integration by parts is going to be a very powerful tool. It'll help us integrate products. It'll help us integrate log functions. It will help us integrate inverse trig functions. So integration by parts is going to be a really powerful tool once we get to it. <clears throat> Any questions on either of those setups? <clears throat> let's do a volume one. So let's go ahead and do one with a. Uh, uh, let's do the trough one. That just seems to be problematic, repeated, repeatedly problematic. So, so let's do a trap. Let's do a trapezoidal face, and that's going to be. Um, I think they call it an isosceles trapezoid, where the, these two legs are equal in length, and I, I think it's an isosceles trapezoid. Okay, so we'll just say that this distance across here is four. This distance across here, let's say, is eight. And then it's a trough, so it's got some dimension to it, so it's going to go back, and we'll say that it goes back 10 meters. Okay, so there's our trough. Let's suppose, let's do a little modification. Let's suppose that it is, in fact, only filled halfway. So it's filled to a height of 4. <coughs> And let's pump it out. Let's do the same thing where we have a spout that's coming out of the tank. And we're going to, that's. So spout coming out, and the height of the spout um, is going to be, let's make that, let's see, that's four. Let's just make that. So that's five above the height of the tank. So that thing comes out five above the tank, but the tank's only halfway full. Yeah, but you don't know where's the height of the tank, right? I mean, the, you, we know the height of the tank. Oh, four. Not, not yet. Oh, I didn't tell you the height of the tank, did I? Yeah, but you told us how much half the tank was. I told you how much half the tank was. Oh, <laughs> so I mean, we know the height yeah. of the tank's eight. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, good point. All right. 
trying to make up problems on the fly. Yeah, so this whole distance is eight. Height. <laughs> All right. How much work is done? A lot. <laughs> Terrible drawing. <laughs> so that, uh, that goes all the way to the bottom. Anyone having trouble finding the right edge equation? Point slope formula. Any questions on the line? What will the width of our cross section be? I think the dy. Two times. So the width that will be equation. two times the x value. So if we're drawing a representative cross section right across here. So let me put this W next to that, not the actual, let's put it right there. This distance right here is X. X measures from the Y axis over. So then we're going to double it. <clears throat> so that'll be the width of our representative cross section. Okay. 
<clears throat> so what is the area of a representative cross-section? Multiply the width by Pen. So that's how long it is. And then we'll measure it by, multiply it by dy to get the actual slice volume. So let's set that up. So volume will be ADD, so 9.8 times 1,000, ADD. <clears throat> so the second D, the distance traveled. So if we've got this pipe that's coming out from the bottom, and it's going 5 meters above, the distance that the slice has to travel is going to be right there. So that's going to be 13 minus y. 13 minus y. We have a horizontal element, so that means we're integrating with respect to y. So there's our ADD. <clears throat> cross-sectional area and then the thickness so there are all the pieces and how about limits of integration zero to four. yeah zero to four we have the limits of integration represent the physical location of the water Zero to four. And let's just pull the constants out. So we're going to have 98,000. 98, and then in here, we have that. Now, let's factor out the half. Dealing with that half is a little bit of a, a little bit annoying in there when we have to foil it and everything. So let's just do this because this will be helpful if we are good at this when we get to trigonometric substitution. If we pull that half out, so that's a two in the denominator. When that 2 comes out, what does this become? Adding the y plus 8. Everyone agree with that? There's no 2 in this denominator, but you could make one. You could multiply by 2 over 2, and then this 2 and this 2 are factored out as that 2, and then you have multiplication right there. You have 4 times 2 to be 8. So that'll let, just make the foiling a lot simpler because we're not dealing with fractions, first order or last of fractions. <clears throat> so let's just go one more step here. So it's going to be 49,000. No. Yeah, 49,000. Uh, no. What should that be? I think it's a 49,000. Is it 49? 8, 9. Oh, yeah, it is 49. 0 to 4, so foiling this, we get minus y squared plus 5y plus 104 dy. Now, we'll, you can integrate that and plug in the limits pretty easily. Any questions on any of the steps there? The hardest part tends to be the W. Is there anyone that has a question on the W? Does that all make sense by now? W is the whole distance across. But when you write this right edge as an x value, that's only measuring from the y-axis. Right? That x value measures from the y-axis over. Just like a function right, written as a y equals just measures from the x-axis up. Same idea. <clears throat> Those functions measure from the axes. <clears throat> All right. Do you do an arc length? Sure. Do you have one? No, not in there. Okay, so let's do a setup of an arc length most likely because arc length. What is that page? Oh, that's the 
that's that. Oh, weird. Um, so arc length can be a total nightmare in terms of the integration if the functions aren't you know cooked up nicely. So let's set, let's go through a setup of an arc length. I can so, give you one from the uh, quiz if you want. I have it. Sure. Uh, the function is three fifths x to the five thirds. Quantity of the five thirds or yes. just the x? Sorry. Minus three fourths x quantity to the one third. Plus five. Plus five? And the one third is on the three fourths or? No. Uh, no, you, no, you no, have no, to write Okay, just like that. Okay. And then it was from one to 27. So one to 27 for x. And we're just finding arc length, so we don't have to worry about an axis of rotation or anything. This is given as a function of x, so we're using an x interval, so we're going to replace. So in general, we think of the integral of ds is finding arc length. S is the, let's put the S on the side. S is the integral of ds, but again, we don't know anything about S. Everything is in terms of x, so we've got to convert. So this is going to be the square root of 1 plus the derivative squared, dx. So we've got our limits of integration, 1 to 27. We need the derivative of this function. Let's come over here. So the derivative is going to be 1x to the 2 thirds, and then here minus, pull that down, the 3's cancel, so we get minus 1 fourth x to the minus 2 thirds. <clears throat> and then here we have to square that quantity, so let's do 1 prime squared, we have to FOIL, so that's going to be the first squared. And we're going to just leave it, uh, leave it, slide over. Okay. we're going to focus on the, the middle term. So let's just leave this all in parentheses here, squared. And so in parentheses, in the middle here, we're going to have 2 times AB with a minus sign. So this is going to be minus 2 times a times b, and that's going to be 2 times 1 fourth in here. Yep. So the x to the 2 thirds and the x to the minus 2 thirds, those multiply to x to the 0, which is 1. And then we double this coefficient, and we're going to get negative 1 half. So here's where we have that whole thing with the we have that, we have minus one half, we have plus that. And then we add one. So one plus y prime squared is going to make it that plus a half plus that. And we add one to both sides. The negative half becomes a positive half. And this is where all things change. Let's come down through here and let's just write it down. So one to 27 square root. 1 plus, uh, so this is going to be x to the 2 thirds, and the only thing that's going to be different, it's going to be x to the 2 thirds plus 1 fourth x to the minus 2 thirds quantity squared dx. So that thing down there is factorable. This is now a sum of squares. whereas that was the difference of squares up there. So the square root and the square are going to cancel here, so we'll have x to the 2 thirds, which integrates, and x to the minus 2 thirds, which integrates. We'll stop there. If you want to stick around for a minute, we can go all the way to the end of it, but we'll stop here unless we, someone wants to do. All